Great. So, so thank you all for, for joining us today. This is a, um, an opportunity for us to learn about uh, two projects. The uh, um, the project that we are, we the, I should say first, I'm, I'm David Blockstein with the Bard College, um, the co-director of the Worldwide Teach-In on Climate and Justice. And this is a project of the graduate programs of sustainability in Bard College. And uh, we are delighted to have you all here for our regular, um, Wednesday webinars. We, we do these each week with different speakers. And today we're um, delighted to uh, be uh, joined today by all of you and uh, by our, our two special guests who I will introduce uh, in a moment. Uh, why don't we, since there aren't too many of us, uh, just uh, quickly go around and, and introduce ourselves. And, and I'll call on you just in the order that you appear on my Zoom screen and just uh, you know, name and institution and a other quick thing you want to share. So Jeff, do you want to begin, please? Sure. Uh, Jeff Leahy, I'm the head of school at the Colorado Rocky Mountain School out here in Carbondale, Colorado. Great, thanks. And Arla? I'm sorry, I, I, I think you said my name. Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah, just <laughs> it, it just cut, yourself. Off, cut off in that second. My name is Armela, and I am currently in Albania. I am um, grad. I, I'm just starting my graduate school and global sustainability uh, in US very soon. <laughs> Thank you. Right. So it, yeah. And and Armela is. Uh, um, oh yeah, I'm also <laughs> helping out. <laughs> in organizing uh, this year worldwide teaching by reaching out to people in the European um, zone, in the not only European Union, uh, and making them aware of the teaching, what it is, and how they can participate. Great. Um, if you do have anybody in that area that you know, and you would think they are the best person for the teaching, will I'm sure that we'll go uh, over later for anybody who doesn't know what the teach-in is. Um, I would, uh, I'll share my contacts and if you want to refer them to me or give them my contacts, I would highly appreciate it. <laughs> Great. Since Thank I got the opportunity to say that, sorry. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Amela. And uh, I'm going to say your name wrong, I'm afraid, but um, Oyungarov, Kirill. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, I'm from Mongolia, and I learned about this program um, when I was here in Egypt for the Conference of You uh, from a guy who's doing this from Kyrgyzstan, if I'm not mistaken. Um, yeah, Samar. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, Samar, yeah. So um, I'm not really related to any academic institution, but I'm very closely working with um, my professors from the National University of Mongolia. And we thought it would be a great opportunity to disseminate info to like um, high schoolers as well as university students. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, we're delighted to have you. I think you're the first person from Mongolia that we've had the opportunity <laughs> to be working with. So great. glad, glad to have you, you by way of uh, COP27. So Anne? Yeah. Thank Anne you. Anne Brown. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm in Livermore, California, and I'm a networker. I'll be disseminating all the worldwide teaching info to a number of schools and organizations here, mostly in the Bay Area. Thanks for having me. Wonderful. Alyssa? Hi, everyone. Um, sorry, I apologize for the background noise. My name is Elisa, and I'm the Climate and Resilience Education Task Force Coordinator for the Climate and Resilience Education Task Force, and we'll be disseminating um, information about the worldwide teaching across uh, New York State. Great to have you with us again. Amy? Amy Reher? All right, well, let's go on to Elspeth. 
Hi, good morning, folks. I'm Elspeth Sheher from Indiana University. I am the new associate director of the school's integrated program in the environment. Um, so I'm new to all this, but looking forward to organizing an event, hopefully this spring for IU. And I do also network with some local and regional high schools. So I'm hoping to pass along information and resources to them as well. Thanks for having me. Great. And also pass along my greetings to Sarah. She's a, a wonderful person to work with. I will. I might have to dip early to actually meet with her. So I will tell her. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Alec? Uh, hello, everyone. Good day. I am Alec. I'm from the Philippines. And I am a professor currently working on, uh, at Our Lady of Fatima. University here in the Philippines. So excited to um, to have this teach ins with you. It's been nice meeting you all. Great. All right. And uh, Gilbert. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Gilbert and how I am based here in Kenya. And uh, currently, I am studying uh, English academic purposes through open society, universal network, refugee higher education access program. Finally, I am here to gain new skills in order to in order to to know way how I will contribute in fighting the climate change. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you for being with us. And uh, Amy, are you able to unmute and introduce yourself? Okay, well then let's begin and I'll introduce our, our first speaker, which is uh, Emily Fano, who is uh, a, a senior, um, I'm going to get your title wrong, Emily, so you're going to have to correct me, but a, a, a senior um, education uh, um, leader with the uh, National Wildlife Federation in uh, New York City. And it's been our pleasure to be uh, working with uh, Emily uh, um, since over the summer in uh, crafting this um, project, this uh, challenge of the um, Teach 10 Hours for Climate. And uh, I will uh, turn it to Emily to uh, begin the presentation. Thanks, David. Uh, nice to meet everyone. Um, my title's slightly different now. I'm Senior Manager for Climate Resilience Education for the National Wildlife Federation um, nationally. And um, we're really excited to partner with um, David and the folks at Bard College Graduate Programs and Sustainability um, to promote the worldwide teaching. And really excited to connect with so many folks from across the country and across the world. Um, Nice to see the international uh, dimension to this to this group. Um, so I'm going to start uh, my presentation about our Teach 10 Hours for Climate campaign. So um, I'll begin. I'm sure that most of you have um, seen the UN climate report from last month, which said that country pledges to reduce greenhouse gas emissions um, at the last COP would lead to cuts of less than 1% or uh, of projected greenhouse gas emissions by 2030. Um, according to UNEP, when we need a 45% reduction of greenhouse gas emissions reduction. So we're nowhere near the scale and pace um, of emissions reductions required to stay within a 1.5 degree warming world. Um, the United Nations says that education is key to addressing climate change. Um, we know that it can encourage um, people to change their attitudes and behavior. It helps people make informed decisions. Um, young people can be taught the impact of global warming and learn how to adapt. And um, it motivates young people to take action um, because knowledge is the antidote to anxiety as well. Um, and yet we know that data from UNESCO from 100 countries shows that only half of the world's national education curricula make any reference to climate change at all. And we have the same issue in the United States. Um, in the US, only 36 states um, and the District of Columbia include the reality of human-caused climate change in their state learning standards, and the rest reference the human role as a possibility 
um, or a matter of scientific debate or omit it entirely like in Florida. Um, and students are seeing climate impacts happening all around them. And they want to understand the causes and the solutions. And so while there are individual teachers like Bertha Vasquez, who's pictured here, who we've been in touch with, who go above and beyond um, to teach about climate, even when their state standards don't include it, um, you know, the, the majority of schools in, uh, in our state anyway and nationwide are not rising to the challenge um, at the scale needed. We know that around half of middle school science teachers either don't cover the subject of climate change or spend less than two hours a year on it, according to a survey by the National Center for Science Education. We also, in our Climate and Resilience Education Task Force, conducted a survey in June of 2021 in partnership with the Teachers Union, the United Federation of Teachers, and we got about 1,500 responses um, and got some very interesting results. And so while we were very happy to see that about half of New York City teachers say they do teach about climate change, um, only about, uh, they, they do so for only about one to two hours per school year, which mirrors the national average. Um, and mostly because they lack the time and training and resources to do so. And we also got confirmation that uh, very few teachers actually uh, receive climate education training in order to teach about climate change. Uh, but attitudes have changed over the last uh, few years in the United States, which we're very happy about. Um, recent polls out of the Yale Center for Climate Change Communication um, have shown that a majority support climate education, a majority of Americans do, regardless of political affiliation. And uh, they agree that schools should teach about the causes and consequences of climate change. And in fact, an NPR uh, poll, an Ipsos poll from 2019, um, showed that 84% of parents with children under 18 agree that um, the topic should be taught in schools as early as elementary schools, and 86% of teachers believe that it should be taught in schools as well. So in, in New York City specifically, students have been calling for a climate education mandate since for eight years, um, as you can see, working through um, the Glo um, Global Kids, which is a, a nonprofit there, and Alliance for um, Climate Education, which is now Action for Climate Emergency, I believe. Um, and so through our task force, we are um, building on that work now with a cohort of high school youth who have been meeting with elected officials and decision makers to demand the climate education that they want and that they need and deserve. Um, and one that goes beyond climate science uh, and also uh, addresses the plethora of issues um, that climate, um, the climate crisis impacts. And students need an education that is preparing them for the future and for the high-skilled jobs um, in emerging green sectors. So these include, uh, of course, energy efficiency, transmission, distribution, and storage, um, clean transportation, water conservation, forestry, circular economics, um, there's just so many issues that that climate um, impacts and, um, you know, teachers will will also need to learn how to teach about these topics and so they will need the training um, to be able to teach about these things. And we know that our youth are anxious about the future. I'm sure you've all seen the, sur you know, the surveys, the global studies um, showing how students are anxious about the future. They feel that governments have failed them. They're not listening to them. Um, they feel afraid and anxious um, and angry. Um, and many youth groups and environmental groups are uh, marching in the streets. They're advocating for climate action in the tens and hundreds of thousands, thankfully, um, here and across the world. But more often than not, they, the crowds are not demanding climate education, which we believe is a huge oversight. And we're working to encourage these groups to um, include climate education in their platforms. So this is one of the main reasons that uh, National Wildlife Federation and BARD College's Graduate Programs in Sustainability launched the Teach 10 Hours campaign in 2022 to increase the amount of time fivefold um, that K-12 students spend learning and teachers spend teaching about this existential topic um, and gain the knowledge and skills they need to adapt to a rapidly changing world. And we believe that 10 hours is really not a lot of not a lot of time at all. Um, and it sounds like a modest request given the scale of the crisis, which it is. 
Um, but we feel that it's an achievable start, especially for teachers that may not be teaching about it at all. And so what the um, National Wildlife Federation has done is we've created a pledge page at um, www.teach10hoursforclimate.org. Um, and I can put it in the chat uh, when, I'm, when I'm done. Um, and you will find a pledge form at that website where you can um, pledge your, yourself and uh, your colleagues, your friends, your students um, to uh, teach and learn about climate change. Um, in, on that pledge form or on that pledge page rather, we also have um, embedded a wonderful guide that was designed by Sasha Horvath, who was a member of our uh, youth steering committee um, two years ago and was also an intern at BARD. Um, and the guide uh, that she created includes a, an interactive worksheet and a progress tracker to help participants um, achieve their 10 hours and keep track of their progress. And it also includes um, curriculum resources that people can access um, and, um, the, and activities that can count towards those 10 hours, um, as well as a number of inspiring photographs as well. And one of those things that uh, people can use to um, achieve those 10 hours is actually to participate in the Worldwide Teach-In on March 29th, 2023. So we encourage everyone to please visit the pledge page, make their pledge, and also to participate in the teach-in in March. And um, that's all I have to share. Thank you. And I'll take any questions. If anyone has any questions. Yeah, you th thank you very much, Emily. So if you have questions or comments, you can um, just either uh, um, unmute yourself and ask it or or just put it into the chat. We're a small enough group, but go ahead, Ann, please. Yeah, hi, I've been a longtime supporter of National Wildlife Foundation, and I love the curriculum on schoolyard habitats. So I'm assuming that um, if I'm able to work with schools to create a schoolyard habitat, that counts as climate education. Um, so I'm trying to... Um, reach out to a lot of schools through school gardening and green schoolyards. As a climate educator, I think they're the ideal like kind of space for students to feel closer to nature and begin to care about what happens um, to our planet. So um, I really appreciate all the resources National Wildlife um, shares with the world. And I want everyone to know about that schoolyard habitats curriculum. It's, it's fantastic, thanks. Oh, and also, I'm wondering, in your suite of um, curriculum materials, do you include things that are specific to wildlife? Yeah, I mean, the National Wildlife Federation has is is about wildlife, uh, and you know, uh, bringing folks together to to conserve wildlife um, in a rapidly changing world. And so, um, most of our curricula um, have a, a wildlife component. Um, I I did. Um, put in the chat as well, in addition to the pledge page website, um, a website to a program that I manage called the Resilient Schools Consortium. Um, and that is that also has a free and downloadable curriculum. Um, and it's a middle and high school program uh, that educates students about climate science, climate impacts, climate justice, and resilient solutions. And we um, focus a lot of, on um, nat nature-based features like green infrastructure, um, like dune, dune restoration and um, uh, you know wetlands and and different features of that of that nature. So there's three different versions of that curriculum. Um, they that focuses on um, coastal uh, flooding and um, urban heat island. And I uh, just wanted to put that in the chat as a resource. And that's Thank also in the guide. Yeah, I'd love to hear from other callers from other continents about how they feel wildlife might help reach students to care about climate. And I'm sure you all have some wildlife issues. I've read some really great inspiring reports of how local communities are um, helping to protect their wildlife as a resilience measure for their communities to have sustainable income and businesses. So I'd love to hear from others about this. Gilbert, you have your hand raised, you could uh respond to Anne if you want, or, or just to go ahead and ask, ask or comment your question. 
Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my question uh, is structured as follows. As I am very interested in fighting climate change, I have a plan which I am still working on in the forms in the forms in forms of uh, teaching four hours for climate. So my question is this: Is it possible to send some models which I will uh, use in order to teach my fellow students here in Kenya? Thank you. Emily, do you want to respond to that? Um, sure, Gilbert. Yes, thank you so much for the question. Um, I, given you know your unique geography um, and you know your probably the uniqueness of your student population, what kinds of models would you are you looking for? I, I am looking the kind of models like the strategy, which will touch people into their hearts so that they can start feeling it. Thank mm -hmm. you. Okay, I am, as we're talking, I'm looking up um, a, um, a really good publication which came out recently by the Global Center on Adaptation um, that featured case studies um, for resilience and adaptation in school settings. It's called Stories of Resilience. I'm Googling it now um, and I'll bring up the report for you. Um, and I think that may have a lot of interesting models for you. Um, there are some models from Africa in there um, and that might be um, helpful to you. So as soon as I get the proper link, I will share it in the chat. And I hope that will be helpful for you. Great, th 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 thank you Gilbert for the question and Emily for the response and I'll just um, say that we are recording this um, webinar and um, we will afterwards we will share with each of you um, a, a message with the link to the uh, recording with the uh, slides from um, each of our presenters and then with any uh, resources that you put into the chat so if you have something that you want to share in the chat, just go ahead and post that in the chat in the chat and we can share that with everybody. So let me now turn to our, our second presenter, um, Liza Cochran, who we've only been uh, I'm working with for about a month, but uh, it's been a, 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 a quick uh, partnership because uh, Eliza is uh, with a, a group called Write the World that uh, seems to have a lot of value in the kinds of things that we're all concerned about in terms of uh, literacy and uh, critical thinking and critical right and also um, integration of climate and sustainability. So Eliza is a senior project manager with Write the World and we'll turn it to Eliza now. So thank you, Eliza. Eliza thank, you, David. thank you, thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, Thanks so much to Emily for all the, the info on Teach 10 Hours and to David and Tobias for bringing us together today. It is such a heartening and necessary experience. I'm sure we all share this feeling to, to come together as a community of educators um, and talk about this topic. Um, so let me go ahead and share my screen. All right. So as David said, my name is Liza Cochran and I'm a senior project manager at Write the World. Uh, focused on my role in particular is focused on the student experience. So really how can we engage young writers uh, ages 13 to 19 in a meaningful writing process that both motivates students and gives them the tools to develop their voices and, and speak up on what matters most to them. Uh, Write the World is made up of 30,000 students and educators from around the globe. And um, 
thinking of, of writing as a critical piece of climate education, the question that has been coming to the surface for us over the past few years is how can we support these students in seeing themselves as instruments in addressing the climate emergency and really capable of affecting positive change around the world. So in our um, you know, 10 or 15 minutes together today, I'll first talk a bit about how Write the World engages students in climate action. And then I'll shift to your classrooms and uh, outline ways that, that Write the World can support your efforts. So how can writing get young people engaged in climate action? Uh, at Write the World, we see writing as a way to foster a sense of personal connection and responsibility. Climate change, at least in some parts of the world, can still feel like an abstract or distant problem, but writing can really make the impact of a changing climate concrete and, and immediate and real to young people. Writing also builds a sense of agency, a confidence that is essential in order to act and that helps guard against that hopelessness that Emily was, was, was referencing as well in the face of such an enormous crisis. So diving a little deeper, what does that actually look like on the Write the World platform? How does Write the World foster that sense of, of personal connection? We really wanna create as many opportunities as possible for young people to get in touch with and articulate how they are connected to the climate. In the Write the World community, we do this through writing prompts and competitions, uh, workshops, camps, writing groups that, that are focused on these topics. And our prompts and writing guidelines really drive at two different areas. The first is how does the climate crisis impact you personally as a young person? So your community, your environment, your sense of the future, your hopes and dreams, plans and priorities. And the implied message here is this is a crisis that impacts all of us that no one is immune to. And then the second area is how are you connected to the environment, the globe, the natural world? How do they rejuvenate and sustain you? Uh, I imagine that so many of us as educators struggle with how to provide a sense of hope and love for our planet amidst these dark projections. And this type of writing shows that, that both are possible and both are, are connected, that the urgency of climate change and the connection to our world is what can help fuel action. Writing also fosters a sense of agency. Um, so at Write the World, we're communicating to our students that we see this topic as one of critical importance and that we see what students have to say about it of critical importance as well. Their voices can affect real change and their voices are needed. And so we communicate this to writers in a few different ways. The first is that we really give students uh, the experience of writing for an audience, what we call a, a real world writing. So as I mentioned earlier, um, our community is made up of 40,000 young writers and educators from over 100 countries around the world. Um, and so for most high school students, um, you know, their experience of writing is really limited to sharing their an assignment with a teacher for a grade um, in the vacuum of a classroom. Whereas at Write the World, um, having a sense of waiting readers and a supportive audience can make such a difference uh, in, in students' experience of the writing process and, and um, fuel that sense of, of agency. Um, my writing matters. So what that actually looks like on the platform is that once a student publishes a piece of writing, it is available immediately for, for comments and for peer reviews. And um, if they're in a classroom setting for rubric based feedback from their teacher. Um, so that means that a student can publish a piece of writing in the tiny town of Lincoln, Vermont, where I am, for example, and then, you know, wake up the next morning and there's a peer review waiting for them from a student in New Delhi or Auckland or, or Singapore um, that has come in over, overnight. So this is all playing out in real time in the community um, day, day and night. Um, in addition, we seek out forms of professional recognition for our young writers, and that's a form of, of audience as well, um, and ways to broaden that audience for their work. So we partner with organizations whenever possible. Um, we had a competition a couple months ago that we partnered with Malala Fund, so they also published the winning entries. And then we work with guest judges for our competitions. We had a, um, a climate writing competition in October and Bill McKibben was the guest judge. And so, you know, those um, voices really lend credibility to the perspectives of young people. Again, the message to the young writers is, is, is what you have to say on this topic matters. 
Um, and then we publish uh, exemplar pieces and associated teacher resources um, in our literary journal, which comes out a few times a year. Um, we also published a book, Writers on Earth, which is a collection of environmental and climate writing, a variety of, of genres, and that comes with a, with a teaching guide as well. Um, we also foster agency by positioning writing as a form of change making. So, so showing students that writing takes all different shapes and forms and exposing them to, to genres um, across the board. So, you know, opinion writing, letters to the editor, letters to policymakers, scientific reports, um, personal essays, fiction, poetry, all of these have a role to play in influencing the conversation around climate change and sowing the seeds for action. And then finally, we foster agency by giving students the firsthand experience of, of writing skills, really being instruments of agency and action. So giving them these concrete skills that um, are, is arming them with, with the confidence to use those skills and to speak up. Uh, the Write the World community is, you know, it is a publishing platform, but it is not only a publishing platform. Um, all of the, the prompts and writing resources um, writing guidelines, rubrics, they all have um, a rich and, and um, uh, you know, deep pedagogy that is embedded into them. So we're building out the skills of, of young people in order for them to speak out effectively. So you might be wondering, you know, what, how do I take this to my classroom? Um, how can I integrate some of this into my classroom? What's the relationship between what Write the World is doing and what I can do with my students? Um, the Write the World platform is a combination of this interactive global community that I've just described, and then private groups where teachers can host their own classrooms. And as a, as a teacher, you can decide you know, how much interaction you want between the two. You might assign a prompt or competition for your students that is taking place on the global platform, and that way the students you know, your students have this sense of that broader audience and can exchange peer reviews and comments with other young writers around the world. But you also might um, utilize our lesson plans just within your private classroom group and build out a unit, for example, on something like advocacy writing. Um, or you might do both of those things. Uh, so we support classroom writing with monthly lesson plans um, that are aligned with our competitions. Uh, we also have lesson plans aligned with our literary journal, um, the Write the World Review, and then we put out an educator newsletter every couple of weeks, um, which also includes, you know, ideas for classroom activities, lesson plans, ways to integrate the global platform with, with, cla with the, uh, classroom teaching. We have some, some really exciting uh, upcoming climate writing opportunities. Um, Last month, as I mentioned, we had a climate writing competition uh, guest judged by Bill McKibben, and I'm, I'm just mentioning it here again with some links so that you can check out the writing guidelines and the winning pieces. I wish we had time to, to dive into all of this, the, the pieces are, are just incredible. I really encourage you all to, to read them, um, as well as the commentary by McKibben, um, just to get a sense of how, you know, how the educator resources can support your integration of competitions and other write the world uh, writing opportunities into your classroom. And then opening November 21st, which is Monday, um, is our advocacy letter writing competition. We are collaborating with the JFK Library and Prince William's annual Earthshot Award for this competition. Um, the Earthshot Award, if you haven't heard of it, is designed to uh, and this is in their words, uncover and scale the innovative solutions that will repair our planet. And it focuses on five environmental uh, imperatives. So we're inviting students to write a letter to their nation's president, prime minister, or leader, which is one of the most powerful actions that young people can take to steer humanity's course to a better future. Uh, in 400 words or less, we're asking writers to tell their leaders, why their focus on one or more of Earthshot's imperatives is vital to our planet. So this page, uh, which I'll show you in just a moment, is just a like a, a preview of the competition. But beginning Monday, um, you know, we'll post writing guidelines and, and resources. Um, we also have some resources for educators that I'll send out to the mailing list as well. And then entries are due on December 6th. So it opens the, the 21st and then entries are due on December 6th. Um, and then uh, in March, we will participate in the Worldwide Teach-In um, and, and please stay tuned for more details on that. Um, let me just show you briefly. So we're calling this competition the Writers on Earth competition. 
hopefully you all are seeing my screen um, with upcoming Writers on Earth writing competition. Is that right? Yes. Great. Um, and so this, again, as I mentioned, is just, you know, this paragraph just gives an overview of what the competition is asking for in entries, um, but come back to this page on Monday for, for um, uh, more resources. Um, and then finally, <clears throat> how can, oops, sorry, y'all, let's see. Um, the moment. Okay, so how to join Write the World and subscribe to Write the World's Educator newsletter. Um, I've included links here. Uh, you simply go to this link to sign up for a free educator account. There's also another link here if you're interested in creating a, a private group on the site. And then once you have signed up for an educator's account, you'll be asked if you want to subscribe to the educator newsletter. Um, that's where we will you know, post updates, um, links to writing resources, updates on competitions and information about the worldwide teach-in. Um, and if you have questions, ideas, uh, we'd always love to hear from you. You can email me directly. My email address is at the bottom there, um, as well as a, a more general email address for educators. Um, so I will stop there and am happy to answer any questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Liza. This is, uh, I think, a great, uh, a great program and, um, Gilbert, I'm I'm not sure why you're uh, you're not hearing us. I think it, the rest of us are, and so I have to share the room with you. Um, but I, I think that you know one of the things that we can talk about is why or um, sort of how maybe we can integrate some some of the writing into this idea of teaching ten hours, and uh, um, you know clearly. Writing is a part of uh, almost every uh, subject area, and one of our key points is that we need to um, be teaching and teaching about climate in, in every subject area, not just in the science classes where it's more traditional. So are there questions or, or comments uh, from anybody? Either for Eliza or, or for Emily? I have a question for Eliza. Um, with this advocacy letter um, competition, can you can students write letters to other legislators, or does it have to be the president? Yeah, thanks, Eliza. Um, great question. We have framed it as write a letter to your president or your nation's leader because of the connection to the JFK Library, uh, which is hosting hosting the Earthshot event. Um, but you know, I agree with you that it would be beneficial to to open it up beyond that 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 um, that requirement. And um, in the materials that we will be compiling for educators and and resources and lesson plans, you know, we can certainly include other other options. Even though the competition itself will be focused on the letters to to a president or or um, nations leader. Great. Other questions or, or comments? Yeah, I'll jump in. Please. So I put in the chat the link to Climate Classroom, and that is a 14 lesson um, teaching plan. It's cross-disciplinary. And in uh, Climate Classroom, we don't really talk about the science. We just give a brief overview, but it's mostly about civic and communication um, mm -hmm. solutions. So um, I love this concept of Write the World. We do have lessons on meeting with a local leader of influence. Mm -hmm. It could start with a um, school principal, could be city council, could be your mayor, and um, helping kids understand that if they have those people of influence on their at their back, they will be really heard a lot more. And then we have um, lessons on communicating with your congressman, because with citizens climate education, we've been trying to pass a price on carbon, and so um, we are mainly dealing with our representatives and senators. So that's a tool for everybody to know about those those lessons that help them. But I also want to mention that uh, we in Livermore have a poet laureate. 
and our poet laureate has launched um, kind of like a teen poetry, I don't know if it's a competition, but she's eliciting teen poetry about certain topics. And so um, the climate and the environment was is the current topic. And we're hoping to uh, showcase those teen poets at a public reading, as well as try to help them get published. So I'm so excited to know about Write the World. And I will let our poet laureate know that this is a platform on which those poets can be published. Thanks a lot. Fantastic. Yeah, we did a really, um, a really cool project with um, Public Radio International a couple summers ago where they featured some of our teen poets from around the world who had written on on the subject of climate and the environment. Um, and then, you know, they actually recorded their voices reading, reading their poetry and, and, um, and then put it on the, on the radio. So yes, I'd love to, I'd love to connect to Maureen. Good. Yeah. Thank you. And, 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 and uh, yeah, I think we, we'll all be interested in the resources in terms of advocacy writing, because that's one of the things that uh, um, we had talked with uh, Liza and her colleague when we initially met is one of the resources that will be useful for the, the teach-ins in March is to have tools to help um, students and other teach-in participants to uh, take the next step. Uh, you, you, you've learned something about uh, climate justice and climate solutions, and so how do you communicate that? So, um, so thank you all. What I'm going to do now, I know some of you are, are quite familiar with the worldwide teach-in, climate and just and and others are uh, at least there are a few of you who are are, are just uh, learning about that so I'm going to spend just a couple minutes um, talking about uh, that um, our our project that is bringing us all together here um, and uh, let me get to my right window here. We have about 80 windows open here. So um, that uh, just to, to briefly share with you our um, our website, um, which has a big long name here, but if you just go to worldwideteaching.org, that will get you to that point. And our goal here is to really reach um, hundreds of thousands all around the world in structured conversations about climate change, climate solutions, and climate justice. We, um, this is our fourth year in the, uh, the project, the overall project that we uh, modestly call uh, Solve Climate by 2030. And as we when we started was uh, sort of the beginning of when we all locked down under the, the pandemic, um, we're unfortunately still have uh, um, COVID with us, but people are gathering now in person. And so last year we started a combination of in-person and uh, virtual and, and, and hybrid events. Our goal, it will just, first of all, that sort of, this is what our, approach really is that the biggest threat to our future is thinking that someone else is going to lead and that someone else is going to solve the climate crisis. And the fact that each of you um, is here with us today shows that that's not your thinking, but we need to get others to, to step up with us. And so our model is to engage people on a combination of either event-based activities on or around the 29th of April, 2023, or in um, classroom-based activities. So I'm gonna just show our one minute uh, video here. Uh, David, there's no audio. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. 
Um, I don't know if David is frozen for other folks. Is that? Yeah, OK. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Tobias. I, I work with Worldwide Teaching. Um, so just for now, I'll just put this video um, in the chat. Um, actually, I, I should be able to, to share it. So I'll just do that while David resolves his tech. OK, and he's gone. Um, thanks, everyone, for bearing with us. Can folks see my screen? No, I can't. Okay. Yep. Great. Our generation, your worldwide teaching will mobilize the power of educators and students and empower a generation of fighting to stabilize the climate and advance climate injustice. We all need to get comfortable talking about climate all the time. The teaching helps us do that. The Worldwide Teach In is a call to organize events on campus or community on or around March 29, 2023. The key to a successful teaching is relying on homegrown talent, not outside experts. The more local educators you involve directly from your school or community, the more people will attend the event. They will do this gradually because they are really worried about the climate change like you. Our team is here to support you, but you have to step forward. Join us. Um, yeah, so that's our quick little uh, teaser. We uh, welcome you to share it with the uh, folks in your institution to share a little bit about the teaching. Um, and just kind of to, to say what I think basically David would say is, we're really just trying to really inspire folks to take the initiative to host uh, a conversation and a multidisciplinary event in their institution with their community to be talking about climate change and solutions and engage folks who aren't typically engaged in, in climate change. So we really encourage folks to, to engage faculty members who aren't necessarily climate experts, but can find ways to still talk about climate change. Uh, and we have a number of models, some that are uh, these, you know, bigger events, uh, teach-ins, or in some that are teach-ins uh, within the classroom. And we have resources to help teachers have a day of climate education in the classroom. Um, so I'll share some links uh, in the chat right now, and then we'll also be sharing those after. Uh, I know there's some folks who are here who uh, have, have been here a few times, and, um, and if those folks want to register their teach-in, and have not done uh, so yet. That is the link I just put in. Uh, and that's a really important first step because then you're in our system and we can share all the, the necessary resources to get you started on that. Um, so yeah, sorry that David, uh, we lost David, um, but I just wanna thank everyone for coming. Um, and before we leave, does anyone have any questions about the Worldwide Teach-In? Um, we can just talk for a moment. Okay, yeah, if uh, folks feel good about it, I'll put my contact in the chat. Uh, please reach out. Uh, and again, we'll, we'll be in touch after with some of these resources. Um, so thank you, everyone. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, Liza. Uh, this was a really great conversation. We're really grateful and excited to have you. And we hope you can be in touch and host a teach-in in your institution and community. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank Bye. You. Have a good day. Thank you, everyone.